Good evening and welcome to Desiring God Live. My name is Scott Anderson and we're coming to you tonight from Roosevelt Island, uh, just across from New York City's Upper East Side. Our guest tonight is Pastor Tim Keller, and Tim, it's great to have you on the broadcast tonight. Glad to have you on the island. <laughs> Very good to be here. Well, Tim is a minister at Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, a church which he founded in 1989. Redeemer has since grown to now having five services across three different campuses, and their weekly attendance is over 5,000 people. Before that time, uh, Tim spent nine years in Hopewell, Virginia, pastoring a church there, and during that time he also served as the director for church planning for the PCA. Tim grew up in uh, Lehigh Valley, Pennsylvania, and he received his education from Bucknell University, from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and from Westminster Theological Seminary. Besides pastoring, Tim also has authored several books, including Ministries of Mercy, the New York Times bestseller, The Reason for God. He also wrote a book entitled The Prodigal God, another entitled Counterfeit Gods, and then he's also produced a DVD and book study series entitled The Gospel in Life. Tonight on the broadcast, we're going to focus on Tim's latest book, which is entitled Generous Justice, How the Grace of God Makes Us Just. Tim is married to Kathy, and they have three sons, and again, thank you for having us in your home. We that, appreciate that. That was amazingly accurate and a wonderful reminder to me of several things I'd almost forgotten. Well, very good. Well, we want to kick off the broadcast tonight by uh, just talking a little bit about uh, you and your life. And so I wonder if you would, uh, let's start with the home you grew up in and maybe take us through just growing up and uh, to the point at which you became a Christian, your conversion story. Ah, well, um, I, was, I was raised in uh, Pennsylvania in a uh, middle-class home. I was raised, uh, since we're doing a spiritual narrative, I was raised in a Lutheran church, not a conservative Lutheran church, a pretty, uh, uh, I, think it was a, I think back then it was called the LCA, Lutheran Church in America. Uh, I went through uh, the, uh, their, what they call their catechetical class and, and learned parts of the Augsburg Confession and it was two years and was confirmed and um, baptized in the, in the uh, Lutheran Church. I uh, went off to college, had probably what most, uh, what many, many kids raised in the church had, which was a, uh, uh, a lot of questions, both intellectually about whether Christianity was true. Uh, I had also plenty of temptations to not lead a Christian life, but about halfway, maybe, well, actually not true. More than halfway through, um, the uh, my my freshman year, I was dragged off to an intervarsity Christian fellowship meeting. Uh, I really heard the gospel, especially not so much I heard the gospel in the meetings, but I actually, in a sense, discovered the gospel through reading intervarsity press books or the kind of books that intervarsity back in those days had. So they were, they tend to be John Stott books, uh, then J.I. Packer books, of course, some C.S. Lewis. Uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it was really a tonic. I saw a thoughtful kind of Christianity. I think I became a Christian somewhere in my uh, junior year, though maybe I can get back later on and say that actually going to seminary and understanding the gospel more fully makes both my wife and I wonder whether, whether we may have gotten, actually gotten converted in seminary. Mm -hmm. But essentially, it, through InterVarsity, I became an evangelical Christian and uh, decided to go into the ministry and went off to Gordon-Conwell. So that was, and actually was out of Gordon-Conwell as a full-time pastor of a congregation at the age of 24 in 1975. So that's, that's the narrative. We'll talk about that a little bit then um, from the college days too. When, when did you sense a, a, a call to pastoral ministry where you knew this is what you wanted to give your life to? Well, I was very active in university, and I enjoyed leading the Bible studies and doing the kinds of ministries that uh, student leaders did. I found them very, very satisfying. So probably, um, I probably uh, got involved with InterVarsity my freshman year, probably had something of a spiritual crisis and made a commitment uh, during my sophomore year. Uh, we became very active as a leader by my junior year, so by the end of the junior year, I was already pretty sure I wanted to go into ministry. 
All right. Well, uh, talk to me a little bit then about West Hopewell Presbyterian Church in Hopewell, Virginia. Uh, it's a, a contrast to the church I have now. Okay. Uh, West Hopewell, I mean, Hopewell is a, um, um, a, an industrial town in the south. It, it does not grow or shrink much. I noticed that its, it's census uh, figures have almost been the same through the 70s, 80s, 90s. It's pretty interesting. Um, what you call a working class community. And I uh, became the pastor of a church there that had gone through some, it was hurting at the time, it needed a lot of renewal. It wasn't a, uh, they'd had some uh, problems with the pastor before, which isn't all that surprising, and there was division in the church. So I had a, what I would say is a traditional uh, a pastorate there, but I learned the ropes. Uh, the people, even though I was very young, my wife and I were loved by those folks, um, and they were, and many of them were very simple people, so I could not put on intellectual airs. As my wife said, I learned to put the cookies on, uh, you know, on the shelf for everybody, down far enough that it was accessible for everybody, not way up high. And uh, it, was a, it was really a great time. And I actually feel that there's a tendency for young ministers to think the best way to learn the ministry is to go be an assistant pastor to some great grand high puba guru and some great church and then I get mentored, and then I go off and I do something else. The trouble is, when you do that, you're a specialist. No matter how much you might learn from uh, uh, the, 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 how vital a big, a big growing church is, uh, you're, if you're on there as an assistant, you're a specialist, and you're not marrying and burying and, and, and counseling everybody from uh, age 80 to age 8, and you're just not doing everything. You're also probably not preaching as much. I, I preached... Starting at age 24, I preached Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I had two weeks off a year. <laughs> I also did probably a wedding and a funeral every month, and I spoke at the nursing home. And I, I, I remember when I got done with my nine years in West Hopewell, I had something like 13 or 1,400 expositions that I had done at the age of 33. Wow. And I look back on that, and I would say that was, and I also had a loving congregation that dealt with, you know, dealt with me as a young man and was pretty pretty compassionate and understanding. And so I, I don't know what, 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 I love that particular way in which I was prepared. And I do think that that's a, that people underestimate just going and taking a regular old church and just doing the job for a number of years as a young, as young minister. Very good. You, I like, you speak of those years very uh, affectionately. affectionately. Yes. yes. Well, you know, Hopewell is a working class town, so people don't move. You know, if you lose your job, this is where you're from, and you look around for other jobs, you don't move. And so uh, we still, even though we've been gone for, um, you know, 25 years, we still have lots of friends there uh, because they don't, because they're there. And uh, so we show up there, even though it's been 25 years, we know lots of folks, still do. Well, let's take it uh, fast forward a little bit then to uh, the fall of 1989. Uh, That's there, going very fast. <laughs> there is a uh, whisking a, through my life. <laughs> <laughs> there's a little Bible study happening just over here, mm -hmm. uh, on the Upper East Side here, and uh, I'm curious as to the beginnings then of of Redeemer. What what was happening in that Bible study, and what became clear during that time that made you decide, yeah, we want to go for this. We want to start a church. Uh, well, the order was a little different. The the um, uh, I was a uh, I was teaching at Westminster Seminary, but I was also uh, a part-time on the um, staff of, of the Presbyterian Church in America's Home Missions Board, which we were called Mission to North America. And because of that, uh, they were asking me to research Manhattan as a place for possible church planting. So I actually got to know some of the people up here who were interested in getting a church started. And um, I tried at first to get other people to come because I didn't think, I'd only been at Westminster for probably four, three or four years, and I really liked it, and I didn't want to go, and I was looking for somebody else. So how many people turned it down? Uh, well, there were, well, more than one, but I, there were two people, very definitely, that we pushed and recruited, both of whom are pretty good friends of mine still, by the way, and in, for various reasons, the doors weren't open for them. At a certain point, some of the people in that core group said, why don't you try the idea out? 
and Kathy and I felt that God was calling us. So, all right. And then, did the uh, how long was it when you started meeting with this core group before you you decided, yeah, this is going to work, and we're going to go for this thing? Well, we actually, I think, probably in '87, in the fall of '87, we started. I started coming up here to meet with some people and found three or four couples that looked pretty interested in starting a church. Um, three of them eventually said became part of the original core group. So I was meeting with them and trying to learn the lay of the land up here. Uh, and a, one of the couples was the one who said, why don't you consider? Once we decided to come, we just started, uh, we said, gather a group of people and start a Bible study. So the moment we first met with a kind of the weekly Bible study, we already knew we were going to come. But I came up from Philadelphia once a week. Um, came up on Sundays and uh, always took one of our three sons. We didn't want to have all three at once because we were afraid nobody would ask us back if we had all three at once. How old were your boys then? Uh, well, in 1989, they would have been um, six and, you know, six and eight and nine and ten, that kind of thing. Um, so we would come up and we had the Bible study probably from February of 89 to April. And then in April, we started an evening service. And then we went, the evening service was weekly um, from April through June, then we moved here. We kept up the evening service until September, went to a morning and an evening service. And that was really when we got launched. So the, the Bible study was started after we decided we were gonna come. Oh, I see. No matter what. Sure. We didn't, we didn't try it out. But we did know a couple of the couples over the two years when we were trying to weigh whether we should come. Now in those early days, did you have a, uh, a clear sense from the research you had done that we want to reach young urbanites, that we want to be uh, uh, gospel-centered, that we want to try to affect change spiritually, socially, culturally, that we care about cell groups and small groups? How much of the, the current Redeemer vision was in kernel form back then? Or was, were you guys no. just trying to gather people and, and make this thing fly? No, that's right. It, it was in kernel form. We, we were talking to people about it, about almost all those things. If, we look, if I look at my oldest kind of uh, handouts, things that I prepared to, to discuss with even the earliest group. Almost all those things are there in embryonic form, yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, I was 38 when we moved here and turned 39 just a month or two later. So I was, I don't know where you put that in your, a person's life. I wasn't, I wasn't a young man exactly anymore. I was just on the verge of, of uh, you know, I'd already spent 15, 20 years, so I actually had developed a lot of my ideas. So I wasn't, I wasn't a kid, but I was still young enough, I think, at that point to be flexible, to learn new things, and also to appeal to a lot of young people. Hmm, hmm. Did you have other leaders that you were able to recruit into this, or did you uh, raise up from within uh, with your core group? Boy, lots, well, first of all, I had great lay leaders, and I had an interesting combination of Campus Crusade for Christ folks who... Kathy and I look back on and say they put the evangelistic uh, genes in Redeemer, if you want to call it that. that. The evangelistic DNA of Redeemer, to a great degree, was inserted by them. Um, we also had a lot of Presbyterians who wanted to, and Reformed folks who wanted to really make sure that the theology was there. And it was a wonderful merger of high regard for theology and a real passion for personal evangelism. That came from the lay people. And then, yes, I had some excellent, uh, uh, some of the, because the church grew, we stepped out and we started um, bringing on some pastors and they, they all put their fingerprints on it as well. So it's not, it really wasn't just Tim and Kathy's uh, church by any means, even from the word go. Hmm. That's remarkable. Well, let me talk or ask you a little bit about um, the centrality of the gospel. Uh, I'm curious as to when that, the realization that uh, the gospel is for all of life when did that become important to you personally? When did it capture your own heart? And then uh, when did it begin to shape your pastoral ministry, both in terms of how you preach as well as sort of your overall philosophy of ministry? It, you know, for, first of all, it's all, I have to be so, we have to be so careful when we say we are a gospel-centered church. I mean, virtually any evangelical or Protestant church would say we're gospel-centered, and in a certain sense they are. But what, what happened in, at Gordon-Conwell, largely, was I took a course, a set of courses with Richard Lovelace on the, uh, basically on revivals. He had a course called Dynamics of Spiritual Life, out of which the book came. 
and I was in the first version of that. He also had a course called Evangelical Awakenings. And essentially in there, he, he basically proved to me that historically that, that even though people believe the, the doctrine of justification by grace through faith alone, they, uh, they lose the grasp on it somehow. They, they lose the idea of the implication of it. They lose the joy of it. They, they believe it in their head, but it doesn't actually work itself out. I mean, it's very, very simply, they, they, they still feel that uh, at the heart level, they're still earning their salvation. And as a result, everybody's touchy and insecure and weighted down and burdened. With up, if, they, if you give them a test, they'll, they'll give you the right answers on justification by grace and faith. Um, but that revivals happen when that doctrine actually gets recovered. And people say, oh, so wait a minute, that's what it means. And that all came out in those early uh, courses. Secondly, uh, we took, my wife and I took these courses together, Kathy, because I met her at seminary and we got married right it, before we left seminary. The second set of courses that got, got that uh, across was Meredith Klein's courses on covenant. And Kathy would actually say that even though she was very active in Christian activities and so on, that it wasn't until she was in Meredith Klein's course and she heard this basic idea. The covenant, there's blessings and curses. If you obey the covenant, you're blessed. If you disobey, you're cursed. Jesus Christ comes to earth as a human being, becomes a, a servant, you know, even though he's Lord, he becomes a servant and he fulfills the covenant. He obeys the Ten Commandments. He loves God with all his heart, soul, strength, and mind, and he loves his neighbor as himself. So at the end of his life, what does he get? What should he get? He deserves the blessing. He's the only human being who ever entered into a covenant with the Father and fulfilled it. He deserves the blessing. But instead of taking that blessing at the end of his life, he puts his, hands, his head in the noose and he takes what you and I deserve because we're covenant breakers. He, he uh, takes the curse. So he earns the blessing of the covenant, but instead takes our curse of the covenant so that when we believe in him, we get his blessing. And um, it wasn't until we were in, a, in that class and heard that that we actually figured out what justification was. It wasn't just pardon. It wasn't just, you know, God now has pardoned us. And Kathy and I basically thought what that meant was that God pardoned you and then you had one more chance and maybe another chance and another chance and another chance to really live a good life. It wasn't until we understood imputation, though Klein was using covenantal language, that you get the blessing... Uh, be, which he earned, and he gets the curse that you earned. That we never really understood that. We even heard the word imputation, but it, the penny didn't drop. Yeah, and we realized we actually had been earning our own salvation. Now that, and then there was a third thing in seminary, is we, even though Ed Clowney was at Westminster Seminary, he wasn't at Gordon-Conwell Seminary, Ed Clowney came up and did a series of lectures on how you had to preach Christ from every text. And that if you didn't preach Christ in the end of a text, you were basically preaching what he called a synagogue sermon, a sermon that could be preached in a synagogue, or a mosque, almost, where you were just telling people how they had to live, and not showing that only through Christ could you possibly live that way, and only because of Christ can God uh, still accept you even though you don't live that way. In other words, you have to get to Jesus. I never quite put all the three together. Here's Klein's covenantal theology, here's Clowney, preach the God, preach Christ every time, otherwise you're being moralistic. Here's uh, Richard Lovelace saying that you have to somehow get just the, the gospel out of people's brains and into, into this, their heart, into the very center of their lives, and show them that, that this transforms everything. Otherwise, they just keep it in a compartment and there's, there's deadness all through their life and their church. I got that, I thought it was exciting, I got out into the flat of my ministry and I really had no idea how that actually fleshed out. In the end, it probably took me um, through most of my nine years at West Hopewell, slowly by slowly I started to figure out how to preach the gospel better. It happened very much in increments. I went to Westminster Seminary, taught in Philadelphia there, but I went to Jack Miller's church at New Life. Jack showed me another level of how you use the gospel in people's lives to bring about, you know, uh, renewal. And I began to, to connect the way I saw 
a ministry go at New Life Church with Loveless. So I actually I learned a lot of things in seminary that I, I, I basically had the blueprints in my head. I just didn't know how to flesh them out. Um, my experience at West Hopewell and my experience at, at, in Philadelphia at, at New Life put me in a position where I felt like, hey, if I could just start a church now, start one without any tradition, I think I, think I know how this all fits. So when I got started at, at Redeemer, I had all that all those ideas about the centrality of the gospel in my rhetoric, in my presentation, in my vision. I still wasn't sure how it would fit exactly, how it would work out, especially not in an urban area. But I would, so I would say it was, it, it, it was very, very incremental. I had the, 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 the foundation in seminary, spent about 15 to 20 years figuring out how it worked out, and then said, now give me a place to stand, and I think I can do this. I really think we can bring this about. Uh, the fact that it was in the middle of Manhattan was a pretty ambitious, I suppose. Sure. Um, but as it's turned out, God wanted us to do it that way. Amen. And that's a long answer, but I can't help it because that was a hard question. <laughs> well, and so your time at Redeemer has been a continued refining of that in your preaching, massaging yeah. this into yeah, every aspect sure. of the church program and that sure. sort of thing. I've been 21 and a half years, and so you can, I can even see it. People now, unfortunately parse my sermons, they listen to my sermons, and, they, and then they write me about them. Yeah. And I can see, actually, that, that even 10 years ago, and I'm, I was 50 10 years ago, uh, that, that it, I was still preaching a, li a little differently than I am now. So I feel like I've improved, and I hope I continue to. Sure, sure. Well, let me talk about influences. You mentioned a few in the answer to that question. And uh, as it relates to just your own spiritual formation, and uh, the crystallizing of certain theological viewpoints and aspects of the gospel, that type of thing. I'd like to just throw out some okay. names. Okay, I'll be sure. And uh, just if you can respond by just telling us, uh, maybe helping our viewers that well, might who, not know, who, who, who are these are, people? Right. Uh, and then uh, how, how they had a unique influence on your life. So we'll start, uh, let's just start with a, uh, a theologian, Jonathan Edwards. Do well, you think any of your viewers don't know who he is? You never know. You never know. People who... Tune in to Desiring God channel. <laughs> Don't know who Jonathan Edwards is. So who is he, and, and how has he uniquely shaped your ministry in life? Well, Edwards Theology Revival. Okay. Uh, I, I don't think, I think where I entered Edwards, slightly different places where Pat, than Pastor John entered um, with Desiring God. I entered really the Theology Revival. How do you renew somebody? How do you renew a church? So I read his narrative of surprising conversions with tremendous interest in seminary. Hmm. Uh, and, was seminary your first exposure to Yes, everything? oh yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, narrative Surprising Conversions and Thoughts on Revival hmm. um, and um, Distinguishing Marks, uh, Charity and Its Fruits, and uh, of course Religious Affections. So I was, what I was, I was looking at, uh, well I even looked at that set of sermons that he, that, that brought about the initial revival, his Sermon on Justification by Faith. So I was particularly interested in him as a theologian of revival. I've come to respect him on all sorts of fronts now. Good, good. Well, let me throw out another name here. Um, let's go to J.R.R. Tolkien. You think your viewers haven't heard of him? <laughs> <laughs> we could do this with every name. No, no sure. that's not true. Some of them you won't have. <laughs> okay. I don't all right. think. All right. <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't know what to say. Uh, just Tolkien is a, has helped me... Uh, with, he's helped my imagination. I mean, um, Tolkien is a devout Catholic, and yet, and I'm not. <laughs> However, because he uh, he brought his faith to bear into uh, into uh, narrative, into fiction, and into literature, the um, uh, his Christianity, uh, which is pretty mere Christian, in certain in other words, his. His understanding of human sin, need for grace, need for redemption, fleshed out in a, uh, you know, in fiction has just been an inspiration to me. I, I guess what I mean by inspiration is this. I mean, actually, he's harder to. Whenever people ask me about this, I always had find. I always do what I'm doing now, which is stutter and stammer to try to explain why it means so much. Uh, he, he, he has. He gives you a way of grasping glory that I otherwise would 
be hard, it would be hard for me to appreciate glory. Glory just seems to be overwhelming and even sort of abstract. Um, glory, weightiness, uh, beauty, excellence, brilliance, virtue. He, 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 he shows it to you in some of his characters. So that's all. I, I mean, he, um, when people say, how often have you read Lord of the Rings? The right answer is, I actually don't ever stop. I'm always in it. And therefore, the number of times I've read it, plus his other works, is actually uh, too many, too many times to, to enumerate. I actually never stop. So, so always going through it, just always cycling through it, or yeah, wow, mm -hmm. that's wonderful. How many years you've been doing that? Uh, my, actually, Kathy, my wife, um, gave them to me originally. Oh, wow. So, wow. well, let's jump to another one, maybe in a similar vein. Uh, C.S. Lewis. Um, Lewis has taught me a couple things. One is he wrote my wife four times when she was 12, and she, he actually showed me by the way in which he always answered his letters, and he would never talk down to the kids. He, would, uh, he showed me something about the importance of pastoral care, just remembering people and thinking of people. And uh, We've always been very touched by that. Um, he's also the perfect, oh my goodness, his illustrations. Um, Kathy and I both look back and say that immersing myself in Lewis meant you can, I can never go more than about a minute without think, trying to think of an illustration. You know, I, it's not for me enough just to say, Here is, here's justification. I just need to find an illustration because he was just, he had all these brilliant, beautiful, clear, you know, crystal clear illustrations. Mm -hmm. So I would say, I mean, there's a lot more than that. I mean, a lot of his themes, but. I'd say he taught me as a preacher how to illustrate, as a pastor, and how to care about uh, answering your letters and getting back to people. That's a really helpful answer. Um, well, you mentioned him already, uh, Jack Miller. What uh, unique role did he play in your life and forming your thinking? Um, Jack was able to repent in a way. He repented at the drop of a hat but in a way that was not forced or, I don't know how to say it, treacly. I know that's kind of a British word, treacle pudding. Sappy, syrupy, you know, oh, get away. You know, there's some people are always saying they're sorry and uh, making you feel like, oh, forget I even brought it up. Um, but he, he really could repent from the heart. And he, 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 that was a big issue for him. He said that the, the most... Um, uh, the spiritual giants to him were people who could repent quickly, joyfully. Uh, they didn't do it in a self-flagellating way. It was absolutely genuine. Uh, they're very quick to admit when they're wrong. Not defensive at all. Not making excuses. And he sort of showed me a, he showed me gospel character. He really did. Good. Well, let me uh, throw out a few more names here. Uh, Dick Lucas. Uh, Dick Lucas is uh, was the rector of. Uh, St. Helens Church, Bishopsgate. He was an Anglican minister, uh, and he was there from like the 1960s until um, a little after the turn of the century. He was a tremendous expositor, absolutely incredible. Uh, and I actually listened to Luke, Dick Lucas's uh, tapes. I don't know if you remember what tapes are. So you look like a young <laughs> yes, man. Yes, yes, remember so. tapes? Yes, I do. But I, I probably listened to a hundred or hundred and fifty of his tape sermons, and probably two or hundred or even more of Lloyd Jones's sermons. Two British guys, who both uh, preached to Setter City Londoners. Uh, Dick, more or less, in the seventies and eighties. The Lloyd Joneses were mainly for the fifties and sixties. But my understanding of New York was that it's more like Europe than it is like the rest of the country. It's less traditional, more secular, oh yeah. So I said, I am not gonna learn that much by, by, pre, by listening to really effective American preachers. Uh, I did want to find expositors, but I felt like the expositors who were expositing in, this, in the, this country were working with a much more traditional mindset. They could assume a lot more, uh, I guess, understanding of, I don't know, it, not just of the Bible, I guess of the Bible, but even, even having a kind of moral furniture in their head about right and wrong. And I could see that Lloyd-Jones, especially his evening sermons, which were always evangelistic, you brought your nine Christian friends to his evening services. So his evening sermons in 
London in the 50s and 60s, and Dick's lunchtime services, which were also evangelistic, businessmen brought their friends, um, in London in the 70s and 80s, I said, the, their preaching is more calibrated to the kind of person I'm going to be trying to reach. And I think it really, they really, really helped me a great deal. So I listened to hundreds of their messages. Was that early in your ministry once you had started yeah. Redeemer? Yeah. I, didn't, I had not listened to many of uh, Lloyd-Jones sermons before, a little, a few, sure. and almost nothing of Dick Lucas. So in the first few years, I listened to them because I said, I'm dealing with, I'm really dealing with more like the kind of people who live in London and Paris than I am like the people who live in Atlanta or St. Louis. Sure. And um, it, it served me well. Okay. Well, let me uh, throw out one more name because I think that'll, uh, that'll tie into uh, our discussion here about the book Generous Justice. Uh, Harvey Kahn. Harvey was the... Um, now, by, uh, by the way, I should go back and say Dick Luke is still alive, going strong in his 80s. Harvey Kahn has passed away, and um, Harvey was the chairman of the Practical Theology Department at Westminster Seminary when I was there teaching in the Practical Theology Department. So he was actually my chairman, chairman of my department. Um, he was a missionary to Korea before he came to teach apologetics and missions at, at uh, Westminster. And was a, uh, a, he was a brilliant man. I was once told by someone that he could have taught um, in missions or in theology or in New Testament or maybe even Old Testament. He was that good in every one of those fields. But his specialty was city urban missions. That's, that was his love. He lived in the city and he taught urban missions. And he started uh, a journal, Urban Mission. He started a whole several programs to train people in urban mission. And um, because we had weekly department meetings, and he was the chair, and I was on time, and nobody else was, every, year, every week I had about 15 to 20 minutes of talking to Harvey Kahn. And uh, I learned an awful lot from him, especially from the, the books that he was churning out. And he was one of the main reasons why I was interested in coming to New York, because he gave me a passion for missions in the city. So he was very important to me and died untimely. Didn't, I, when I say untimely, I think he was only like 65. And I was really unhappy because he was about to retire, and I expected that he would have turned out a good 10 or 15 years of works like Ed Clowney did after he retired, mm. and he didn't get a chance. So I've always been very disappointed with that. Mm. Well, I appreciate you uh, um, allowing, allowing that question because it, uh, I think it's fascinating to see how God has used uh, different people in our lives yeah. to, to help like to, the penny drops with significant areas in our lives because God brought somebody across our path at some time, whether it's somebody you know, from two centuries ago, or whether it's somebody who was, uh, who's even still alive. And to see that form, and you mentioned Ed Clowney earlier as well, how the different aspects of what God has called you to be as a minister have assembled themselves because of these different influences, in part because of these influences. That's fascinating to me. It is to me. Uh, recently, somebody else actually interviewed me on something about some of these things. It was interesting to see most of the things that you now associate with Redeemer's ministry were actually all laid in by the time I was about you know, 25 or 26. I just didn't really quite know how they would flesh out, except for the city piece. And the city piece came when I was in my 30s teaching at Westminster Seminary and came under the influence of Harvey, plus a couple of his colleagues, Roger Greenway and Edna, his wife Greenway, who were on the faculty at Westminster, Bill Crispin, who was an urban missionary with the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. So the city piece came when I was in my 30s. The other pieces were there. I just didn't see quite how they would come together. Um, but, oh, absolutely. I, I, none of us spring full-blown out of the forehead of God, you know, which I know not, rather than Zeus. But God, he, he, he equips us through other people. That's really important. Well, let's talk about that a little bit as we uh, maybe bring this uh, discussion of uh, kind of your life story in, in the biographical portion to a close. Um, you've, uh, you have now a, a position of, uh, of influence now with others, uh, especially young pastors. Now that I'm, now that so, I'm made desiring God, I mean, now, I mean, this is, this is a whole new level. I appreciate it. Well, you, that. John Piper, and others, many others, there are, uh, for a younger generation, um, you're the burgeoning giants uh, upon whose shoulders uh, a whole new generation of pastors are standing. 
What do you say to the young guys that maybe are watching this? They're, they're now early in their ministries, and they're, they're wanting to emulate certain aspects of your philosophy of ministry, of your core messages. Are there certain things that you would encourage in that regard, in the same way Paul encouraged Timothy to imitate him, even as he imitated Christ? And conversely, are there things uh, that, that guys just ought not emulate uh, from your life in ministry? You know, I'm rereading uh, Lloyd Jones's book, Preaching and Preachers, and he has a statement in there that I know he's made, he made elsewhere. <clears throat> he said, I wouldn't cross the road to listen to my own preaching. And then he says, I know nobody believes that. Um, I really don't know what I want people to emulate. I mean, I, when I, when, when I um, met somebody like Ed Clowney, I mean, I know that some people are looking to me like I looked at John Stott or Ed Clowney or people like that. And I know that in my head. Um, but it's a little bit like aging itself. Now, you probably, I know this will be, this is going to be hard for you to understand, but because you're not old. However, you know how old you are, and yet you just, it just doesn't sink in. You know, like I know I'm 60. Uh, 60 year old men know they're 60 intellectually, but we actually just don't believe it. And that's the reason why we do things, and then we get, you know, we kill our backs. We, I mean, we, we know it, and we don't know it. We know it, and you walk on by. And you suddenly see yourself in the, you know, in a, in a, uh, you know, maybe a, a window or something like that, and you're shocked. You say, "Oh my gosh, I really am old," you know, because you still think yourself as thirty. So you know it, and you don't know it. So I know that I'm seen as, you know, the way I used to look at Ed Clowney or John Stott, but it, it actually is totally unreal to me. So I certainly have no sense that I should be emulated. I know this: when I looked at those guys, I learned things that I. I said, that is something I want to take. That's what I want to take. And I, there was a lot of other people looking at John Stott that took different things. So I, I say, learn what you can. But uh, you know, my, my, my theory is if you cut through, a, if you cut through a, a tree, you see all the rings. And it's good to kind of get really into a, a theological or ministry hero for a while. At one point I read all 70 ex existing George Whitfield sermons, because I loved him. I loved him. This was like when I was my my late 20s. But Kathy, at one point, I remember one point Kathy said, so when do we, when do we move on to some other hero? She said, because she says, on this, in the sermon last Sunday, I thought you were on the verge of saying, methinks. <laughs> and, um, and, and what you do is you go on. You, at a certain point, you just have to move on to somebody else. You get what you can, what you need from George Whitfield, you know, and then you move on to some other hero. One of the problems with modern heroes is because so much of what they say fits because they're talking to a similar audience to yours, there is a danger of getting stuck too long on a modern hero, somebody who's a contemporary, or I mean, somebody who's still alive. So you have to be very careful. You just have to move on. You have to not only read that person's books or not only... Uh, I know authors aren't supposed to say that. Don't only read your books. You're supposed to say, read my books. But, but actually, you really have to get around. And certain things that God wants to do in you through that person will stick. And other things will kind of just go past. So I really don't know what people ought to emulate about me. My guess, is, what I'm trying to say is different people probably need to learn different things, just like I did for my, you know, the people I looked up to. And amidst all of this, people looking up to you... Um you seem to be I'm six, pretty... I'm six four, yeah, so some right. people can't help well, I have it. short man syndrome. I look up to everybody, all, all five foot eight inches That's of me. That's so humble. Yes. Well, speaking of, how do you stay grounded? How do you, uh, do you, do you find, as the books are being produced and as the sermons are being downloaded, how do you fight for humility and, and stay grounded amidst this? Number one, I already told you, it actually doesn't feel real. Just like I no 60-year-old really thinks you're 60, and yet you know you are. It doesn't really seem, um, I mean, I know I'm getting well-known, and yet at the same time, it just doesn't feel real. It doesn't sink in. It, does, it doesn't, I don't walk around saying, gee, I'm really pretty well-known. Just like I don't walk around saying, gee, I'm 60, except some mornings. And then the other thing is you have to have a good marriage. I mean, I don't know how anybody with a good marriage can get a big head. I just don't see how that can happen. Um, if the marriage is good, really good, 
your wife loves you so much that you, you absolutely know she just, you know, uh, all of her criticism is just is rooted in loving, lo love. And yet there's plenty of criticism that comes from your spouse, just like back and forth. If you have a good marriage, I don't know how that could really happen. So, but ultimately, I don't know, you know, I'm waiting for myself to start to really believe it. Kathy would say the same thing. You know, when people come and say, well, you know that so-and-so talked to somebody who said they're reading Tim's books in Timbuktu, and doesn't that, doesn't that amaze you? And she says, no, it just doesn't seem real. And that's mm. exactly right. Mm. So a gift, uh, Kathy's been a gift in that regard. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and she I don't, was... I don't think it's just her. I think any good spouse yeah. helps. Well, she but was, she's particularly good. <laughs> she was on my list here uh, to, to close out influences, actually, of um, has there been a... Um, I, I know there's a profound uh, influence that our spouses have on us, but has there been, over the course of this journey together and God doing this thing called Redeemer, have there been particular ways in which Kathy oh, yeah. has been a tremendous influence or support during given seasons or... You view it differently now than you did back when you guys were just linking arms and jumping in together. Well, uh, humanly speaking, she's the reason I'm, I'm a Calvinist, because she was reformed before I was. I went off to seminary, um, not at all convinced of being reformed. And the way she would put it is she was the beginning of the avalanche. She was the first stones in the avalanche that led. Because actually Dr. Roger Nicole, my professor there, and... R.C. Sproul, who was a visiting professor there, a lot of folks really brought me to reform convictions, but Kathy was the beginning. She really pushed me on that, you know. Um, secondly, uh, she went to seminary with me, and so we have actually forged a lot of, a lot of the things you hear me say, we've forged together. We sit around and say, well, how would you say that? Um, and she's been by far my number one sermon evaluator over the years. So an awful lot of people have I know, you know, there's a lot of great marriages. Kathy has been, most people notice how, uh, how much she um, is, how, how, what a big part of my thinking and my ministry she is. Even though she's never been, um, um, actually she's always been on a, sort of a part-time staff person. She's the editor of our newsletter, et cetera. Uh, in the early days, she essentially did all the jobs and she would actually say, all hundred people on your staff used to do, are now doing things that I used to do, except for preaching. But um, so, you know, she's been a real ministry partner, and, and especially in, in formulating the, my, uh, the, the way in which we communicate the gospel. Amen. That's wonderful. Well said. Well, just a real softball here to close off this section here. Um, a few of our viewers have, uh, have asked, uh, they're curious about uh, just uh, what's a busy pastor like you with writing and preaching and ministry opportunities and everything that's going, no doubt, especially in this town, what do you do for hobbies? What do you do for entertainment uh, to relax? What do you like to do? Now, wait a minute. I'm sorry. This is not a softball <laughs> oh, no. question. You're embarrassing me. Did you know that? I did not know that. So well, now Kathy, I'm even more eager to hear the answer. Well, no. The pro but Kathy says I'm really very, very weak in this area. Avocations, you know, things to, you know, hobbies and things to do. Uh, New York is a hobby. Uh, th this is an endlessly fascinating place, and now I've done a little bit of traveling. I, I would put it up against any city, even, even some of the big, great cities. There's, I love to go to new places, new neighborhoods. I knew, uh, it, there's, uh, it's a walking city. You just go to that place, and you walk around, and you see, oh, my goodness, you see the restaurants and the shops, and you see the, the, uh, the religious institutions of all sorts. You see the mosques and the temples and the... Um, it, it is a, it's an astounding place. So to some degree, New York is my, is my hobby. And um, I have a grandchild. Fortunately, that may, she may really, it's a girl, she may really rescue me because of, to, my problem is, I, my, Kathy thinks my avocations aren't different enough from my vocation. And therefore, this has actually always been a struggle in an area where she continues to um, try to put pressure on me to develop them. So I'm not, I'm not great at that. Okay. Well, that's, that's your holistic approach to uh, maybe, life Maybe. Maybe. Well, you can also call it <laughs> being over, uh, working too hard. Yeah, sure. Um, and, of course, I, I love to read theology that I don't have to read, Right. Hmm. frankly. Sure. You know, the, if theology I don't have to read for presentation, for preaching, for teaching or something, 
But that's where Kathy says, that's not an avocation. <laughs> that's where she goes after me and says, you know, you, you, know, you need to read you know, uh, something totally different than that. You, know? you need to do bird watching. I said, I'm not John Stott. <laughs> so. Well, we're, you're watching Desiring God Live, and we have uh, tonight an interview with uh, Tim Keller, pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church, and uh, we'll be back with more in just a moment.